Thanks. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to Continuing Professional Education Services Hot Topics. Um, we try to bring in important topics and information in the industry out to people. And uh, as you just heard, we do record these. These do uh, end up uh, on our website, uh, seepsnj.com, as part of um, our continuing series of hot topics. You can always go back to them. They are good resources if you uh, need to look up something regulatory-wise or as well as uh, technical or education-wise. Um, I don't remember if I said I'm Phil Brilliant, so I'm uh, one of the board members of uh, of SEEPS. Also with us is Dr. George Berkowitz, who just turned his camera off. That's okay. Uh, he is the chairman of the board of uh, SEEPS. And also somewhere in the uh, Hollywood squares of my Zoom is uh, Julianne Masago, who's our director, our executive director. And uh, really, the reason you're here is because uh, she knows a lot more about uh, Inventbrite and how to get you into these rooms than I do. So uh, we're glad you can be here this morning. Uh, just a quick shout out that we do have two other classes in, uh, in August. Um, if you are a UST certified contractor, we have the UST refresher training on the 14th at the uh, Eco Complex in Bordentown, New Jersey. Um, so if you are need your to renew your your certification, uh, you need that class. If you're looking to take one of the exams for UST certification, uh, you need that class. So that is on August 14th, and I think August 20th we have a deep dive into the administrative requirements for the remediation of contaminated sites, known as ARCs. Um, Going to be a very good interactive class and panel discussions on those things as LSRPs that, uh, you know, we may not uh, dig into as much into ARCs, um, but you need to do. And uh, so that is on our website at seepsnj.com. So with that, I'm going to actually uh, do my introduction because I want to make sure that we are done by nine o'clock this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure um, to introduce uh, with us this morning is Adam Paharik. Uh He is the president of Paharik Associates. And uh, his, you're going to see his face a lot, not just on the screen here, but it's on every slide no, during his no, presentation. No. Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, you know, in complete, uh, you know, transparency, Adam's a good friend of mine, has done my insurance for probably close to 20 years now. Um, a little scary as that may sound, because we're both very young. And, uh, you know, we, uh, as my insurance agent, we had a discussion about this uh um, exclusion of PFAS as it started hitting a, a lot of news uh, earlier this summer and figured, you know what, let's put a quick one together. Let's get some information out to people and the opportunity um, to share that, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I could go through Adam's bio, but uh, we we only have an hour, so yeah, I really yeah. can't do that. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Adam. And uh, Adam, you tell me when you want to share stuff. Thank you can you share know. anything you want to, and it's all yours. Awesome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Phil, brilliant. George Berkowitz and Julianne, thank you for organizing this. My name is Adam Kuparik. I'm from Kuparik and Associates. I'm going to move quickly through the presentation part because I do want to leave adequate time for questions. I'm also going to encourage everybody to use the chat when a slide that I have um, stirs a question in your brain and Phil will have full permission to interrupt me at any point or even if during the presentation, maybe I use insurance jargon or something that Phil says, wait, I'm not an insurance professional. I'm not even sure I understood what he just said there. Just interrupt me and we'll go because the purpose of this presentation is to speak to the non-insurance community about the nuts and bolts of these types of exclusions, how they impact your practice, what, if anything, any of us can do. So I'm going to try to stay at the 1,000 foot level rather than the 50,000 foot level and keep it practical. So there's things like policy considerations and governmental action that could happen as a result of these exclusions. But it's really not my purview, nor has the field developed enough for us to really talk about what, what's up there at that 50,000 foot level. So with that, Bill, you can start sharing the presentation. Yep, and I'm going to jump in real quick because you did... I do apologize. I didn't say it. So again, we encourage questions. Raise your hand. Put them into the chat. Um, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that Adam, uh, you know, can answer them. Um, and if he can't, we'll have we'll find the answers later. But I'm sure it'll be good. But yeah, we encourage interaction as we go through this presentation. How's that look? Uh, yes. Great. Good. Good. So, so uh, the, the logo, well, we're going to move to the next slide, but the logo here, Engineer Insurance Pro, is a sister companion website that I run 
which is a resource for engineers, environmental consultants, surveyors, and architects. It has blog postings, it has articles, it has questions to ask yourself when you're choosing a risk manager and improving your insurance program. It's free, it's membership based. We have a newsletter that comes out from it and everybody's free to join it. So next slide, uh, just some bona fides. Licensed in NJPA, North Carolina, Florida. We insure businesses just like you. We refer to ourselves as concierge style risk management. That means that we like to insure our business owners' businesses, their homes, their loved ones, their family members, so that we can provide 360 de degree protection and give them advice throughout the entire envelope of their professional careers. Next slide, please. Disclaimer, I'm not an attorney. Um, it, this this uh, topic is not really aimed at your particular policy. Everyone's policy is unique and different. Everyone has chosen the carrier that they're with for a specific reason. Uh, I am going to talk about tactics and strategies that might prove useful to you. When in doubt, always, I think that all of you, if you're not, you should be close to your insurance agent or your risk manager. You should be texting, calling them actively and aggressively. I know I encourage my customers to do that. Um, I get texts on weekends. I get calls on Sundays. And uh, I never stop practicing because they are my business and they matter. And it's never a good time to talk about insurance. All right. So that's the end of that disclaimer. So brilliant. Next slide, please. All right. So the LSRPA came out with a good statement, advises their members to consult legal and insurance experts, verify PFAS coverage in 2023, ISO published endorsements, excluding PFAS claims, which may be on CGL, commercial general liability, or PLL, uh, what's called contractor's pollution liability. Uh, LSRP should assess their own risks and negotiate exceptions. Uh, these exclusions cover bodily injury and property damage resulting from PFAS exposure. Members have also reported this on their, uh, seeing this exclusion on a pollution legal liability. And so we ask, how worried should we all be? Um, uh, and I will say the unfortunate answer that um, what, should we be worried? Yes, no, it depends. And it's not necessarily a satisfying answer, but it is the truth on the answer. Um, George asked me a good question before I go to the next slide. And Phil, what I want to do is ask you to just unshare the screen for a quick second. And then I'm going to share an article that will be, be made available to all of you. Uh, if someone could just give me a quick thumbs up to make sure that you see that. All good, Adam. Thank you. Thank well, actually, you. That's, this is, this is a, from, what, say that again, Phil. You have, this is, um says carriers concerned. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Yep. Yeah, so this is an article that I will share with all of you from the big eye. It's an insurance association for agents just like me. And it goes over some really, really basic stuff. But I, I thought this was very interesting. Why did insurance carriers start excluding PFAS claims? There's two parts to this. The first part is, well, or three parts. Number one, because they could and told, nobody told them not to exclude it yet, right? So that's one of the most simple answers, insurance companies are profit driven. They did this so they could, before government told them maybe, well, you can't do this, you can't exclude this. They they jumped ahead and they started excluding it. But here's some logic. If we think they applied logic and not just pure profit motives, carriers are, uh, they model this after asbestos claims. They view what's about to happen with PFAS in our environment, in our world, as similar to what happened with asbestos claims. Asbestos claims cost about $100 billion in losses. There was a wave of lawsuits which crested in the 1990s and then have subsided since the overwhelming cost associated with asbestos claims forced changes in the delivering, the operations, the creation of future and new asbestos products. And so it was really the punitive result of insurance claims that resulted to a change in operations of how asbestos 
is, is put through our environment. So the insurance industry is saying to you that they're modeling that the that this 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 phenomena of PFAS will model a similar envelope of claims as asbestos. And the third reason that they're doing this is something that we call inherent nature of mankind, right? So on everybody's insurance policy right now, war is excluded, nuclear is excluded, and um, there's a total pollution exclusion on a, on a common GL policy. So what, what the insurance industry is saying is that war is inherent to the nature of man, and so therefore it's an uninsurable activity because insurance by its very nature ensures accidents, events that were not supposed to happen and people took reasonable steps to prevent it, but they still happen. Those are occurrences, those are ac uh, actions, those, those are uh, when damages happen, but they are not supposed to happen. War is inherent to man's nature uh, and therefore it's excluded on all policies. And what they're kind of in a way saying is that PFAS is now inherent and uh, embedded in the environment. And so it's going to become increasingly difficult to tell whether the PFAS um, contamination was the result of a professional activity or inherent in the ground from some prior use or prior uh, um, operation that existed on the property prior to you owning it. Bill, if you could then now put the slides, the presentation back up. Okay, and we can move forward to the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> some quick definitions that will help all of us. Most of the professionals on this call uh, will be familiar with their current insurance program, which typically is a combination policy that puts their professional liability, their commercial general liability, and their contractor's pollution liability all on one policy form three different coverage lines from the same carrier, all with a common policy aggregate. And we can imagine the aggregate like a big bucket of gold, right? It's how much gold we can actually apply to, um, to a bunch of claims. That's the aggregate. Imagine it is a pot of gold. And then they all have a common aggregate, and then they have a per claim limitation. We imagine that as a scoop that goes into the pot of gold. And that can, for each claim, the scoop can pour out the gold coins up to a certain amount. So you'll see things like a $2 million policy aggregate with a 1 million scoop per claim or a 5 million policy aggregate with a 5 million scoop per claim, right? What do they all cover? Just very briefly, professional liability covers claims of errors and omissions of professional judgment. You should have done something. You should have known better. You failed to recommend. You failed to do. You didn't do enough. You didn't do it fast enough. You, you missed something that was standard practice in your profession. Er errors of judgment, of professional judgment. These are the lawsuits that these claims will defend. General liability is completely different. General liability covers bodily injury, or property damage that results from your operation. The easiest visual to put in all of our minds is you dig a hole. You dig your operations. You're operating by digging a hole. You swing the shovel back as you dig a hole, and you accidentally hit Grandmama as she is walking by. Grandmama has sustained bodily injury. She sues your business. This is a general liability claim. Uh, yes, we're going to make these slides available, Carrie. Um, she sues your, your policy. She sues your business. The general liability portion of your policy responds. Let me give you one that maybe is not as common or viewed, but it, it's something your industry would understand very well. You are testing soil. You or your subcontractor drilled some sort of a soil sample. You put it in a three-gallon bucket. You put the three-gallon bucket in an open bed of an F-150 pickup owned by your company. You drive from job site to laboratory. You crash your car, your F-150, in an intersection, causing your F-150 to flip over 
and spill the soil in grandma's tomato garden that she has in her front yard. You have created property damage that results from your operation. If it's determined that that soil sample has pollutants, you have accidentally polluted, okay? Which then leads us to, is that a general liability? Is it a result of your operations? Or is it the next coverage line? Contractors pollution liability. This is unintentional, accidental discharge of pollutants. And this is built into most of your policy forms if you have this combination policy. The simplest example I can give you here is you drive your truck to the job site and you are idling your truck while um, you are writing a report on your laptop. You have not stepped out of the truck. You have not dug a hole in the ground. You have not done anything that could be considered operations, but your truck is leaking antifreeze unbeknownst to you. You didn't know it. It wasn't purposeful, but it's leaking. Somehow or another, there is a fissure in the ground where your truck leaks antifreeze and it enters the people's water. And later it's determined that it migrated into the people's water. You have, con you have, you have created an unintentional pollution condition you are now going to be defended by the contractor's pollution uh, liability uh, section of the policy. One last bullet here. The reason why an insurance professional will always seek, not always, but most of the time seek to put you in this combination type of coverage is a, a condition that we call carriers in opposition that they're trying to avoid. I have seen claims where a professional will have the general liability on one carrier and the professional liability on another carrier, and an event will happen that sort of blends the lines or grays the lines between whether it's a general liability occurrence or a professional error. Both carriers will be brought into the lawsuit. Both carriers will point the finger at the other carrier and say, you pay for it first. After you're done paying for it, we'll pay for it. And then, and on, only if you've exhausted your full million dollars will we come in this claim. So in those unfortunate circumstances, the insured is forced to actually sue their own carriers and, and make them come to the table and agree to defend them. It is a terrible situation. And so an insurance professional will seek to avoid this by always recommending or encouraging an environmental professional, anybody in our related profession to have a combination policy where the GL, the PL, and the CPL are all together. I want to pause for 10 seconds just for Phil Brilliant to tell me if there's anything on this slide in the chat or or if anyone wants to raise a hand before we move on. I, I definitely went. Reader's Digest pays for us. There is much more to talk about, about this C, GL, PL, CPL type of combination policy, but it's at the heart of where these exclusions come from. You look good, Adam. I, I don't see anything popping up, and I think you've covered what we talked about. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. You can move on to the next slide. Next, on to the common exclusion. This is very important. If you, I hope you take this back from the presentation. Not every carrier excludes PFAS-type claims. Not every carrier does it in the same way. Not every carrier does it in a way that's harmful to your particular business. But there are many that excluded in some form or another. And uh, we want to, you know, the most common thing in the LSRPA said it, and I say it, is you need to spend time with your insurance professional. You need to go over your exclusion. But let's talk about um, how this exclusion works, why it's there. So the exclusion that I have seen is typically on the general liability section. Okay, Phil, if you would unshare for me, I'm going to share a typical exclusion. I don't know about typical. I don't, I don't want to use the word typical. Does everybody see the PFAS exclusion in bold on the top of this? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I, I'm not going to read you the entire exclusion, but I'm going to read you the parts that really bother me and that I'm not happy with. So it says, this insurance does not apply to, it says bodily injury or property damage in whole or in part, that um, that caused by PFAS or any loss or cost expensive uh, uh, arising out of in whole or in part 
the abating, testing, monitoring, cleaning up, removing, containing, treating, detoxifying, neutralizing, remediating, disposing of PFAS. And you say, but Adam, I'm getting paid to test the soil. They're telling me they're not going to cover my claim. And um, I'm going to say, don't lose faith. They're not exactly saying that, but they are saying that they're not going to cover it on the general liability. Where this exclusion does not exist is on the professional liability. So they are not saying they're not going to cover lawsuits that arise out of your professional judgment to test or sample the ground to look for PFAS and all that. Where the controversy exists and where the coverage gaps may exist is whether in your testing, so I'm just gonna be very oversimplified. I am not a scientist. Forgive me for just breaking this down to the simplest level. We scrape, we dig, we lift soil contents from the ground. We bring it to a lab. If during the digging, if during the actual operation of removing or testing the sample, at some later date, it's determined that the contaminant spread and caused the neighboring property to gain PFAS contamination, you could be theoretically sued for having committed property damage as the result of your operations. You could actually, through your digging or sampling, um, be one day in the future sued and said, well, you spread it. By doing this test, by digging this up, it rained the next day, you spread it, it, it wouldn't have, have spread for not you digging. And again, this is theoretical, and I'll talk more about that later. There is no court case that has actually happened yet in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, related to this and, and the actual act of testing or monitoring. But I'm going to stop sharing this exclusion. I'm not in love with this exclusion because of how definitive it is and how it could apply. Now, there's many of us who will use a sub to actually go and do the drill and the core. And so it wouldn't be your firm that would be on the hook for the testing. It would be the sub that you use if they have the same type of exclusion. They would be on the hook for the property damage or bodily injury that can result from their activity of actually testing. Um, they're not saying that you're going to lose your professional defense, you know, but but again, if for that particular customer, depending upon their operations and what they do, I might look to move us out of that carrier. Phil, if you could share the screen, I want to move on to the next bullet of that next slide. You know, you're really high maintenance. But, Sorry, sir. Um, there we go. Okay. So similarly, I have seen the PFAS exclusion on the contractor's pollution section of the policy. As a reminder, um, contractor's pollution is about accidental, incidental, not on purpose, I didn't mean to pollution events. So the act of testing is a purposeful act. I'm gonna dig here, I'm going to drill here, I'm gonna pour sample here. That would be a purposeful act. That would be a general liability activity. Contractors is more of the idea that I was scraping a sample into a bucket and it was determined that I spilled soil contents on a neighboring property. It was accidental. It was not intentional. That, that's uh, where that exclusion may exist. Once again, on the policies that I have reviewed that have the CPL exclusion, um, it typically is for a mono line policy when you buy your contractor's pollution separately, um, as opposed to the combination policy where you have your PL, your GL, and your CPL together. And typically, I have not seen this activity excluded on the professional liability section. And I can just uniformly say that to give yourselves peace of mind, you make sure you go over with your insurance professional. You should not see this exclusion on the professional side. If you did, you need to move from that carrier right away. But again, I have not seen that on most of the common carriers that do our profession. Um, there is a positive reason why the carrier would seek to exclude this, right? 
and it has to do with something called the other insurance clause, they would seek to exclude this on the GL side so that they can only defend it on the PL side. And this prevents the other exclusion clause on the GL policy to say if there's other insurance that could possibly cover this claim, then we are to be considered excess and secondary, and we will not cover this claim until the other insurance pays for the claim. In some ways, the exclusion simplifies and clarifies where you're going to get your defense coverage. So there is not always a nefarious reason why this exclusion exists on your policy. It is actually in part sometimes the carrier's intent to say, we believe that the lawsuits that will come to environmental uh, professionals for PFAS will be professional liability claims. Therefore, we are excluding the GL and the CPL coverage so that we can simplify and better track how we are going to defend these claims and pay damages on these claims. Phil, any chat, anything before we move on to the next slide? No, only a request for retirement. So we're good. <laughs> I cannot grant it. So I encourage it at some point. Yes. Next slide, sir. We're here. Oh, again, um, which which exclusions hurt the most? You know, the 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 critical point is understanding your operations, understanding what you do, what level of testing or specialization for its PFOS you do whether you sub out your drillings and your core samplings and your other things, and to understand on your specific policy, A, if the, the PFAS exclusion exists, B, if it's really a material um, um, uh, risk factor to, or a strategic risk factor to your business. Now I'm going to just speak. There is one particular carrier who has a product in your profession. It is called Chubb. Okay, Chubb Insurance, Westchester, I think is the paper they write it on, but it commonly is issued without any PFAS exclusion. Okay, so everybody might say to themselves, oh, thanks, Adam. I'll just tell my agent to go to Chubb, Westchester, and we'll move our program tomorrow. I would just ask everybody to see caution on sort of the one size fits all solutions. The reason you might not be in Chubb as of today is that Chubb has a restricted appetite. They like certain types of environmental practices. They don't like other types. Your work mix, how much you work with industrial clients, what type of pollution or remediation work you're doing, whether or not you work with lots of condo associations might trigger whether Chubb even wants to give you a quote. There's probably a logical reason why your insurance professional um, uh, maybe puts you in the carrier that you're with. These exclusions started to appear only in 2023. Uh, if you have a reputable risk manager who understands this profession, they have probably already reached out to you like I have to my customers and said, hey, I wanna talk about this and how it's on your policy. I want us to understand whether if you have the exclusion, whether what percentage of chance it's going to hurt you and whether we need to do a midterm switch, whether we need to talk about this at your renewal, whether you need to think about how you practice and whether you want to grow in this area or grow away from this area, whether that's even possible, whether you're going to actually be um, subject to this type of risk and therefore we need to make uh, changes. I, I, I can't encourage you enough if you don't have an active relationship with your risk manager, um, then you need to think about moving. So, so here I say on this, there are cases where moving your coverage makes sense. There are cases where leaving the exclusion makes sense. You need to spend time with your agent, with your risk manager, to actually define the operations for them to tell them what parts you do and what parts you sub out. Our field is so broad, there are professionals who make their living doing one side of the work, doing multiple sides of the work, doing field services, doing drilling. Each one of those segments of the environmental space, uh, there are pure report writers, there are wetlands, delineation and permit writers. Each one of those segments of the space 
has a, a different relative risk of whether this exclusion uh, means anything to them. And, uh, you know, I, I will say, I do not see the PFAS exclusion going away. I actually see a day when even the carriers that right now don't have this exclusion, I would predict within three years that every major carrier will have some form of this exclusion on their policy. Adam, that's not fair. I agree. I think it's not fair. I think it does, in some instances, leave a coverage gap for our for this type of professional. I believe the insurance industry is saying this is a societal-wide problem, not an insurance problem. The government needs to take action on this. We cannot, because it has gone on for decades, and we are not getting dragged in only because the lawsuits are starting now. That is, I'm, I'm, I'm really generalizing the response of carriers, but if I was a carrier, that's how I would feel. Any chat questions, anything, Phil, before we move to the next slide? Yeah, so take a drink. I'll give you a question. Um, you know, so one question is, you know, you mentioned our subcontractors. And, you know, many of us, you know, will have a subcontractor agreement. We request the insurance certificate, naming us as additional insured and all those good things that are recommended. Do we need to look deeper now into those certificates of insurance to see if those exclusions exist on our subcontractor policies? Oh, my God. Grasshopper, what a good student. You are excellent. So for those of us that have the opportunity to work with the like the authorities, like the Port Authority or the Dever Delaware River Joint Authority, and for those of us that have seen those insurance contracts, or at least the contracts and the insurance sections, they'll be very familiar with the fact that large authorities or large Fortune 500 companies will have a series of requests for your certificate where they will say like, must not contain a XCU, ex, uh, explosion, collapse, or uh, uh, undermining uh, uh, exclusion on your policy, must not contain an exclusion for completed operations. So yes, Phil Brilliant, yes, I am saying that the day is coming that if you use subcontractor drillers, you may want to consider uh, editing your MSA agreements to include language like um, like A, must uh, subcontractor must provide us with a copy of the forms and endorsements on their professional slash general liability policy for us to review the relevant exclusions and all that. Or we can be direct and say must not contain a PFAS testing exclusion on their GL. I, and eventually you could get the form number from ISO so you could actually reference that on the MSA. You may consider that, okay? However, I said previously, Phil, that within three to five years, I believe this exclusion will exist in some form on everyone's policy. So um, we have subs that we love and are loyal to, and they do a good job for our firms. So we need to balance whether we're going to make this request uh, or whether we're going to say it's going to happen to all of us within three years, we need to live with it and 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 try to manage it. I think a practical needed step is to ask for their forms and endorsements page, and then to deal with your insurance agent or risk manager, have them go exclusion by exclusion and see about whether the type of work you do, whether it makes sense to continue using this sub or to encourage them to seek other coverage. I don't um, want to uniformly, because I happen to ensure many good, loyal, awesome subs. So I, I don't need to be throwing them out of at, at their on time, reliable, on budget for you. Let's not make broad sweeping statements. Um, I forgot one question, but the other question is, I um, and I can't remember from February of this year, are we going to see more and more on the applications? I know we always see, you know, how much asbestos work do you do? How much lead-based power? Are you saying that on all applications we're going to start seeing, uh, are you doing PFAS remediation and how much are you doing? Oh, my gosh. Another great question, Mr. Brilliant. So, interestingly enough, on my way to having to 
gain an understanding of this issue for your profession, um, I made simple requests of a bunch of my carriers. Hey, is there a way to remove this exclusion on such and such a pump? Um, I want to see if I can get rid of this exclusion. I'm not, I'm not interested in a midterm move. I think you've done a great job for us, but I am looking to um, see if you'll waive this for an additional premium. And what I learned during my journey was they started peppering me with about a half dozen questions. How much of this work that do they do? Do they specialize it? Can you give me an example of this kind of work that they've done? And what I started to understand was that yes, they are actively gathering information on the profession and how much of a factor this is in our work and how much revenue percentage is derived from it. So um, a professional in your profession would have to decide to choose whether to actively engage in a conversation with the current carrier that could result in you releasing more knowledge to them than they ask on their renewal application, which could then um, imperil or change your renewal terms versus whether you just decide at renewal to shop and move to maybe a carrier that currently doesn't have the exclusion or that has a lesser egregious version of the exclusion. But <clears throat> to oversimplify the answer to Phil Brilliant's question, if you ask them to remove the exclusion, they're going to start to gather information. So therefore, yes, I do expect additional questions and I do expect um, applications to change over the next few years to take into account the amount of work that we're doing. And they're not gathering this information necessarily for our customers' benefit. And my last question is, you know, people work in sole proprietor, you know, organizations, small companies, some work in large companies, some work in engineering firms where environmental is just one of the disciplines that is offered. Okay. As an LSRP, as an environmental consultant doing the work, involved in the work, maybe doing the proposals, if we're in one of those bigger firms, or even if we're in a small firm, is this something that we need to ask about? Or is it something like, just let the big guys in the finance office deal with? And I, and I know that, I know this is a difficult question, but just, I mean, I'm assuming that the office, the finance offices know what's going on, but where is there anything further as environmental consultants, but more importantly, as LSRPs with our license, yeah. with all those liabilities that we need to be interested, we need to be involved, or can we just rely on the fact that our financial office is going to cover our derriere? Yeah, so that's a very difficult question, and it's complex and has lots of moving parts, right? So I'll try to start it out this way, and then I'll get more specific as, as, as I go. So the first thing that happens is a Environmental firm starts practicing in a state like New Jersey. And when it's born, the day it's born, it has no coverage. It has no insurance, right? So it has 0% of its risks covered. So then it meets with a professional, someone like me, and they sit down and we try to develop an insurance program for a firm like that. And we buy them their first sets of policies. And at that moment in time, we don't necessarily know a full picture of them, of what their firm's gonna be like, of where their risk comes from, of their most likely. We try to develop, we try to ask smart questions, we try to sit with the uh, insured and maybe the project managers and learn about the firm, but we don't have a, a true knowledge. They could be a new firm, they could be moving to a different agent. So we have a, we have 80% of a viewpoint of what we need to do for them because we can't. Maybe they remembered, maybe they forgot to mention that they 5% of their revenue comes from this area, 3% comes from that. Maybe they didn't want to disclose to us some little part of it. So we then are faced with the challenge of bringing to them the broadest coverage possible within a budget that makes sense to them, encouraging them to add endorsements and other coverages like contractual liability language and things like that, which will protect them with their contractual life. And so we then, this negotiation happens where we try to give them as much coverage as we can for a price that makes sense to them. They see options 
And most of us say, yeah, this one is a little less, but I'm going to tell you, I don't like their claims handling. I, I like this firm better. And that business is going to make a decision. Now, what, now I'm going to get more specific. If you were an employee at a large firm and you were the LSRP or a multidisciplinary firm, and you were really worried about the PFAS exclusion, um, out of my 40 something firms, I went to six carriers and asked them if they would waive or remove the PFAS exclusion for any amount of additional premium. And zero of the six carriers agreed to a manuscripted endorsement at any price. So I was not able to in any way sway them that in for this specific case, we should get a supplement, we should lift, we should do all that. Uh, which then, of course, left me with the only solution of whether we're going to move carriers, whether we're going to do this and all. So I am not sure. I mean, I think it'd be useful to start the conversation with the people and the firm that help uh, buy the product, that they're educated and aware of it. I just don't know that there's anything that they could actually do about it at that moment in time. Assuming that the the good the the good of all that um, they picked a product that it was as broad form coverage as possible, they didn't just buy on price. They did listen to their risk manager and take his advice on which product was the best, and um, they 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 made a uh, like a, a good healthy decision for the benefit of their business rather than their pocketbook alone. Uh, I would think that. Moving is not as simple as you would think, because again, someone like Chubb has a more limited appetite. They might do kind of work that Chubb doesn't like anyway. Um, so, so it is not one of these pound the table, pound the, the, the door on the principal's office. You need to change now. Um, it could be a useful discussion, and it you know it. If you're not having these discussions with your risk manager or insurance agent, uh, I think that's unfortunate. I think you should be, um, but it's not, I don't view it as we need to move today other than in certain specific firm circumstances. Okay. Thank you, thank you. That thing's good. I think good, answer, good, answer, good answer to a tough question. Yeah, yeah, my job, right? So, um, has this actually happened yet, right? I, I, no, the answer is no. Yes, there are PFAS lawsuits. Yes, they deal mostly with some sort of industrial um, uh, firm or, or, or legacy business that was operating on a specific site and caused some localized contamination. Yes, there are settlements and claims. Um, there, we don't yet know how many environmental scientists in the next 10 years will be sued for testing PFAS and then causing it to spread to the neighbor property? There is, there is no case law. It's not happening. Uh, I, I see that we're, we're five to 10 years out before we really know how much will, of us will be affected by that. Um, there are more unknowns than knowns at this point. Uh, if I could do anything, um, yes, the exclusion matters. No, I don't think we should be struck with deep fear um, and then see, I believe, government, insurance, courts have a decade of wrangling how this is going to shake out because the problem is greater than an environmental contractor or scientist going in trying to help or remediate or lessen the problem. I would argue that there are bigger first party culprits that are going to have to be adjudicated prior to the third party professionals being dragged in. Of course, I'm, I'm never, I'm never, I never be, I'm ceased to, to be amazed in this modern time and I could be proven wrong by that statement, but I would just generically say this hasn't happened yet. The exclusions are there, the lawsuits are not. 
And at that point, almost like I thought, maybe five minutes late, sorry, Phil, but I'm, I'm now done with my part of the presentation. If you just put the next slide up real quick. Um, so, so this slide, and, and everyone will get this presentation. I'm not going through the whole darn slide. But basically, the, the items in yellow are what an insurance agent does. A risk manager goes with the bullets in blue and goes with everything on the list. Okay, people can fill out apps, people can go to carriers, people can handle claims. Your risk manager should be an active advisor in your business. You deserve a risk manager. Um, we think you should be using risk managers over insurance agents. You can end the presentation. So. Um, so question for you, Adam. Do insurance companies have to get approved from the New Jersey regulators to include these exclusions? Correct. An admitted insurance carrier has to uh, file with the Department of Banking Insurance. ISO makes this form. ISO is the standards organization that develops commonality in language for insurance policies. So ISO makes a form up. They did in 2023. Carriers then adopt the form. They seek approval. So governmental regulators are the ones who allow the exclusions to exist on the policy. Um, one of the things you and I talked about the other day, just to look at this. So right now, when we you pulled that form up, it clearly said um, PFCs and uh, PFOAs. Okay. Right. Uh, P, excuse me, PFOS. PFOS. Didn't didn't say PFOAs, didn't right. say any other emerging contaminants that we're seeing come out of EPA and uh, and DEP. Um, so we're kind of specific now, but could that change at any time? Absolutely. But they have to go through the adoption process right. where ISO creates a new form or a new, uh, uh, you know, exclusion. And then the carriers then adopt that exclusion. And I... I didn't say this before because it's being a little hyper technical, but again, I just want to hit this one point. Most of us on our general liability policy, or in your case, for your profession, on the general liability section of your combination policy, have a total exclusion of pollution. So before this PFAS, there was a total pollution exclusion that existed on most of your policies. The PFAS exclusion is kind of like underlying, underlining and bolding that pollution exclusion to say, and specifically, we mean these things are excluded. If we didn't, we weren't clear enough that all pollution is excluded. We're telling you these things are specifically excluded so that there be no doubt. This makes me laugh because it reminds me of the COVID scare. Um, most general liability policies have a virus exclusion a biological bacteria and virus exclusion on a general liability policy, which says that it's inherent in human nature that we pass bugs on to one another. And therefore we are not going to cover the um, environment. Like if Adam, the salesman for insurance walks into your office and gives you a virus, we are not going to cover that as an operation. It is not bodily injury. We do not consider it um, insurable and we're not covering it because it's inherent in human nature. When COVID came out, they strengthen the exclusion language for viruses and bacteria to include specifically COVID-19 and all that. So they actually went in again and they readopted a stronger exclusion to just say, and if there's any doubt, because maybe this thing was bioengineered by the Chinese and our federal government or whatever, that if there's any doubt, that specific thing is excluded on your policy. And we just want to be extra clear. So keep us as following the same model. And Phil, Phil, can I follow up with that question? Yeah, I, I just want to ask. Yeah, you go first, and I'll come back on Rich's. Follow -up. No, I, you raise a really good point, a very good point. And PFAS is not a PFAS is not a specific chemical. It's a group of over twelve hundred chemicals, and the European Union is actively engaging in studies on forty other chemicals. So this is to me is like tantamount saying, okay, we're going to exclude all organic chemicals or we're going to exclude all toxic metals. Um, it, to me, it's, it's really basically um, 
and a, a lack of understanding of the nature of our work by saying you can't do this, you can't do that. And therefore, we're looking for a, a separate riders that will cost you money in order to obtain those riders. So I believe that um, your point, Phil, is exactly well taken. What's next? Mm -hmm. And the reason that we're dealing with these three chemicals right now and three more to come forward is because simply the, the common use of PFOA and PFOS, P, PFOS. And PFNA worked its way in there. I don't, I don't understand how that happened, but it did. So my point simply is, good point, Phil. And that's why you're my partner. <laughs> and, and to follow up with that, and I'm going to piggyback that with Rich's second point. You know, um, Rich had said, um, is there any, have these exclusions been approved? I think the answer is yes, because yeah. we're seeing it on the form. Yeah. Is there any way to challenge them? or any way to know when new exclusions are coming up to be able to be proactive next time, as opposed to, you know, having this presentation after it's already on a form. Well, then, then what would I do on a Thursday morning? No, just kidding. No, ready? Ready? <laughs> so yes, yes. Um, to George's point, also smart, future exclusions are coming. Okay. More is coming. Okay. And, and court cases, which haven't yet happened, will define whether the current version of the exclusion stands up in court. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm gonna do this right. Homeowners in the 1980s um, didn't have an exclusion for mold. Okay, they didn't have an exclusion for mold. So in Texas, they built a lot of New Jersey style homes with super insulation on the Gulf Coast of Texas. They blew in insulation so that there was zero airspace. There's zero airflow in these modern style houses. It was actually like a New Jersey developer who came out there and built them. The Gulf Coast is extremely humid, extremely humid. Those airspaces that exist in houses are actually really useful. They allow evaporation and flows. So when you seal a house up completely, like they were trying to do in New Jersey with a different kind of environment, you then you breed, you, 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 you grow this dangerous form of black mold, you grow this thing and, and you enculturate it in such a way that it blooms because it has no way to dry and to, to evaporate back into the environment. And so you create, you create these algae blooms, I'm sorry, these mold blooms that then cause hundreds of thousands of dollars in both health and property damage on these beautiful, once beautiful homes. There was no exclusion on the policy. Home insurance carriers were forced to pay these people for this damage. The first version of exclusion came out. It was too broad. It was struck down in the courts after another decade passed and people sued their insurance carrier and said, you can't exclude me for that. A more narrow version of the exclusion that sublimited coverage back to the consumer. Okay, we'll give you 50,000 of mold. We're not giving you unlimited mold. We'll give you 50,000. The insurance industry acknowledged the government saying you can't do that to people. And then it said, but Mr. Government, if we have to cover unlimited mold, which is an inherent condition in everybody's house, and it's in 100% of the homes in the United States of America, mold exists right now, 100% of the time, then we will go bankrupt and you won't have anybody insuring homes. And we believe that it's a net good to the public that we should have insurance on people's homes. So we're asking you, Mr. Government, will you accept uh, a reduced exclusion, a limitation of coverage down to $50,000 worth of mold? The government said, yes, we'll take that. And so now they gave back some coverage to the consumer, but it's it, it's sublimity. It, it stops at a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. And that then that then can cause an insurance carrier to be able to properly amortize their loss over time and say the most we can get out of each policyholder is a $50,000 mold claim times the uh, annual 2% accident rate that is inherent in mankind. And we can multiply that over our 10,000 policyholders and we get how much of mold claims we will have in the next 10 years. And now we can price accordingly and now we're profitable. I think George and Phil's point is that the future looks like a sublimit buyback on a future policy where you will get certain amounts 
of protection for testing and the cleanup or remediation or the removal of if your testing results in grandma's uh, tomato garden to get PFAS contamination, there will be a supplement in our future. But the court cases haven't happened and therefore mm -hmm. uh, the exclusion hasn't been challenged. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can take a breather. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Um, any other questions or comments from uh, from everybody? Anything come up? Anything? Any thoughts? I think it's interesting. I did see uh, that Alex did put a comment that I guess LSRPA is working on a letter to the commissioner and to the commissioner of insurance. Um, you know, again, I, I mean, you know, write your legislators is always a thing, and then see where things go. But I think with the fact that we're already seeing it on a form. Um, we're going to see it more and more. Uh, renewal of policies can have PFAS exclusions hidden. So look carefully was a comment that just came in. Um, you know, so I guess, uh, George, anything else? Uh, yeah, just just quickly. First of all, I think that awarding Elizabeth's dog half credit is very generous because I think it's she's, <laughs> I think she's sleeping right now. Uh, and secondly, hey, Adam, really good job. Really good job. And thank appreciate you. appreciate your efforts, and thank you for doing this. Yeah, I'm grateful that you, you two gave me the opportunity. I hope it was useful to your public. I hope they got something out of it. I'm always available for a follow-up question. Um, I try to be as accessible as possible, and I'm grateful. Yep, and I did put the slides again into the uh, chat. I believe it was emailed out to you also if you registered early. I put some of the articles into the chat. If you need more of them, let us know, and we can uh, definitely get them out to you. Um, yeah, Adam always has a lot of great energy in the morning. Uh, you know, he, uh, you know, he, he'll, he sleeps, uh, you know, inter intermittently, uh, you know, usually probably during the day. Too but, much uh, coffee. I think, too much yeah, coffee. I think the important thing that I took away from this and that, you know, I've had conversations about is that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of times where as professionals, you know, we just kind of glance at certificates of insurance that come in and we kind of, you know, look at things. And as much as uh, George will say all the time, you you need to look behind no further action letters. You need to look behind REOs. I think we've come to an age where we need to look behind insurance documents, especially if we're a sole proprietor or a small mm. business, just to make sure that we're not picking up somebody else's liability. Because mm. that's really the last thing I ever want to do. Mm. And uh, so, um, Adam, any closing remarks? No, just grateful for everybody's time. I hope they found it useful. I'm here for you guys. It, it, it's This is emerging. This is going to be changing. In the next six months, I might have very different opinions on things, um, but I'm grateful for the chance to talk about it. Great. And this will be up on the seepsnja.com website probably within a day. For anybody who's interested in share, watching again, or just uh, you know, see Adam on the uh, treadmill while he's doing his presentation. <laughs> so it works well. Uh, everyone stay cool today in the 95 degree temperature. Um, if you're playing golf, go enjoy. And uh, thanks again for joining us for Seep's Hot Topic and hope to see you at a class. Again, August 14th is UST regulations. August 20th is, uh, and that's in person. August 20th is virtual. And that is a deep dive into ARCs. Um, and that is uh, registrations available online right now. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. If you remember.